I'm so excited to be here. So cool. <laughs> Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I've got some shtick to do, and so while I do it, I'm going to show you something that I use to warm up my students. So I come to you from the border, right? Chicano, Mexicano, de Laredo, Texas. I'm so excited to be here. I do come from San Diego State University. That is my uh, official affiliation, but um, I'm basically a border rat, de Laredo. Um, somehow, academia did not find a way to exile me or kick me out. And now I'm a full professor, so I'm very excited about that. Um, we're looking at the work here of JR, uh, an amazing, uh, uh, I don't even know how to describe him. He's, he's an installation guy. He's an artist. He's a photographer. This is one of his most famous works, Kikito, that he set up in Tecate, uh, uh, in, in California, along the border. And um, on the Mexican side of the border, he put up this giant billboard of a one-year-old child, Den Kikito, curiously looking over the border wall into the United States. Uh, for me, JR's work is monumental. It's an intervention. It's what those of us who are from the border need to do to infect the rest of the nation with the beauty and the knowledge and the ecstasy of being Mexicano in the United States. No more shame, no more crying, no more anger, no more humiliation. We're home. Aquí estamos en nuestra casa, the United States of America. Yeah. It was the worst of times, it was the best of times, and that's where we are now. It's the best of times because never before have we seen so many beautiful Latinxers all over the, the mass media, the entertainment industry. Motion pictures, creative writing, poetry. We've never been more creative. We've never been more in your face. But it's the worst of times, of course, because it's never been such an open season on Mexicanos and Latinos and Latinxers living in the United States. This is our reality. This is where we run from. I run for succor. I take ecstasy, the ecstasy of being Latino, from my mentors and friends and my collaborators. This is the work of Lalo Alcaraz, uh, uh, from La Cucaracha, from Coco, from uh, uh, Las Casas Grandes, the new film on, uh, uh, series on Nickelodeon. And we need satire right now. If we don't laugh, we're just going to cry, and crying's cry not going to change shit. We need to laugh, we need to be assertive, we need to be in the face of those who would humiliate. 
Yo soy el Laredo, Texas. I'm a proud Laredense from uh, La Frontera. And I like to foreground that in my work, and that's why I'm telling you about it again tonight. <laughs> this is actually a photograph on the, uh, the, the bridge in Laredo, Texas, taken by myself back in the day in the 90s. Uh, did not know uh, photography that well, as you can see. <laughs> a little grainy, a little bit grainy. This is the border, it's the crossing, it's the frontera, it's the verge. We're always on the verge of a new tomorrow at the border. The borderlands where I come from have changed in the last 25 years, where the border was open between Laredo and Nuevo Laredo, between Trump and the narcos, everything's been messed up. Everything has gone to shit. And still though, Laredenses and Nuevo Laredenses collaborate, they come together, they try to live their lives along a now militarized border. But we can't accept the border as it is. We've got, we've got to mess it up. We've got to invert it. We've got to attack it. We've got to refigure it. We've got to embrace it. Most of all, we've got to love the border. It'll be hard. The border is the periphery. It's what we associate with the outskirts, the outlying fringes, the outlier. Nobody loves the outlier. And yet, those of us from the border, we're puro outlier. <laughs> and we are from the outside, and yet, because we're from that periphery, we're infected with both sides of the border. We, those of us from the border need to be a little bit more proactive about sharing this ability, this superpower we have to live on both sides of the line and in the line, and with the line, and on the line. This is the border now. Right? At least if you, you know, if you're flipping through your favorite Fox News channel, this is the border, militarized, uh, barbed wire, razor wire, soldiers, National Guardsmen, the, 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 the fake crisis at the border, uh, breaking news, that's any channel you look at now, right? It's like, breaking news, be scared, be very afraid. <laughs> Be afraid, oh, they'll be crossing soon, they're like zombies. <laughs> what I love in TJ and Tijuana, right over from San Diego where I live, is that the Mexicanos the next morning started uh, stealing, cutting all the razor wire and using it as a security device, like ADT in their own homes. So it was like, vamos a repurpose, vamos, vamos a repurpose esa cosa. This also is the border. This is this is La Casa de Mi Suegra. This is my my mother-in-law's house in Laredo, Texas, seven blocks from the Rio Grande. And I don't see any barbed wire. I don't see anything to be afraid of. I see some really nice landscaping, you know, the bricks. Okay, they're a little undulating now because the ground settled. But it's flowers, it's green, it's peaceful. This is my border. Okay, the border is not a war zone. The border's actually in peace. You just have to go there. This was a, like a fresa party I went to. My best, the, one of my best friend's daughters just got married. You know, high sociegate, we call them. High society, high sociegate. Just a bougie party 12 blocks from the U.S.-Mexican border. Notice no razor wire, okay? Open wet bar. Disco. Fun. He fell in the pool later that night. It's great. Just a fiesta. That's the border. This is La Posada Hotel, one block from the U.S.-Mexican border. No soldiers. No security. Well, some security. It's a hotel. But no razor wire. This is, this, this is not barbed wire. These are Christmas lights. Okay? No fear. No breaking news. Just a swimming pool and peace and happiness. And this is the house I grew up in, that I'm selling now, because my parents are both gone now. 1609 Laredo, Texas. Just a wood frame house, working class, the house of a postal clerk and a telephone operator in Laredo, Texas, 10 blocks from the U.S.-Mexican border. Yeah, I don't even want to talk about that. I'll just, uh, I kind of came here today just to share a little of my work, um, and every time I give work, share my work, I have to give 
you know, obedience, honor to my elders. This is Américo Paredes, the author of With His Pistol in His Hand, and George Washington Gomez. And it's, it's very important that we do honor to uh, the, the, the critics. Uh, I'm not a performer. I'm an English professor. I'm a professor of English. And uh, I may hang out with culture class, but yo no soy culture class. Right? <laughs> and so, you know, as professors, we, we need to spend a little bit more time honoring the people who change our lives. So I like to do that in my talks. These are the stereotypes that Stephen was talking about. One of the most popular magazines in the 1930s, no doubt, uh, Trump's grandfather had a treasure trove of these mothers <laughs> under his bed, and little Donnie must have broken in to see them, because every stereotype you could imagine about the Mexican, uh, here he is lazy, he is drunk, and he is armed, right? Spicy Western Stories was the Pulp Fiction, the, like Tarantino's film in the 30s and 40s, right? This is my favorite, of course, because it embodies it's the epitome of the Mexican rapist, though this little lass is about to shoot the hell out of him with the gun. And you can see she's pulling out his gun there, and poor evil rapist is going to go the way of the world. We're black writers. We are rapists. We are criminal. The spider strikes. And, oh my God, uh, the, the Mexican in the American imagination is like a, a, a shorthand for the possibility of insidious sexuality. Here, our Mexican friend is barely, barely in the frame. All we get is his whip and the, the nice gringa damsels that are in, in peril. My work, uh, my most important work, is the book that was mentioned previously. It's all Tex-Mex, Seductive Hallucination of the Mexican in America. And let me see what's next. Oh, OK, one more. One more. I, stereotypes, OK? OK. Trigger warning. <laughs> if you're Mexicano, <laughs> you may not like this shit. Um, this is great. This is a, a pulp fiction from the 60s. Mexico After Dark by William Hobson and Lois O'Connor, written together, no doubt, in some Tijuana chateau. <laughs> <laughs> From pleasure palaces to homegrown drug orgies, the Mexicans know how to add Latin spice to the good life. <laughs> this precedes us. I, in my book, Tex-Mex, I say I can't walk into a room without these ideas having walked into the room before me. They foreground us, they foreshadow us, they infuse us, and we have to, we have to em embrace them to the extent that the, that embracing is a kind of inoculation uh, against the command and control of the stereotype. I used to get asked all the time when I gave talks in 2007, 2008, 2009, when the book came out, well, well, well <laughs> What's going to happen to stereotypes? How, how do we defeat them? Right? You can't. They're language. They're tropic. They operate at the level of the unconscious. The only way to combat stereotypes is to inoculate yourself with intelligence and with travel and with learning other languages and hanging out hey, with other people. I will just attack me. <laughs> all right, so my solution to all these things is something I call Mextasy, and oh, a minute left. Okay, um, Mextasy. My show, Mextasy, is here in Seattle. It opens Saturday night. I hope you can come at 6 p.m. at the Nevada Cultural Arts Gallery, which is in what neighborhood? What did you call it? White, White Center, White Center. Center. like West, south of West Seattle. Southwest, yeah, be there. Um, so Mexicans opening. There's going to be a big pachanga party. It's the opening. Uh, uh, this is my 34th exhibition. Uh, I've been uh, exhibiting my, uh, this. Uh, it's a collection of art. It's a collection of stereotypes. And most of all, it's a collection of the desire to somehow get past the stereotype of the Mexican in 21st century American culture. When I say the word mextasy, of course you're supposed to hear the word ecstasy, right? And there's three important things to keep in mind when you're thinking about ecstasy and maybe mextasy. Okay, the first is 
Ecstasy, the most common word used in erotic fiction and film, right? Ecstasy. Ecstasy is associated with sexual passion. Good thing, right? Yes, everybody likes it. Most people do. It's okay. <laughs> the second association, ecstasy, MDMA, great drug, great party drug, great dance drug, developed by psychiatrists to help married couples who had stopped talking to each other, who had affective disorders. MDMA was developed to loosen you up after a lifetime of passionless coexistence. They don't tell you that in the dance clubs, right? When they're ending. <laughs> but the last ecstasy, you know, because I was, I'm a recovering Catholic, right? Is the ecstasy from the Roman Catholic liturgy, which is actually a good thing because ecstasy is used by practicing Roman Catholics. I'm out of time. I'll just stop. No, I will stop. <laughs> Go on one more minute. Shut up. Okay. Where was I? That light, these lights are killer. That's why I'm over here, out of the light. Okay, um, last thing, ecstasy. Uh, the communion of your psyche and soul with a higher consciousness, a higher being. That is ecstasy, and that is mextasy. We must, Latinos, Latinas, Latinxers, Chicanos, Latin Americans, and our allies, most important, love my allies, must somehow band together to get past the hate, which we will, because there's a great fiesta waiting for us on the other side. I hope you'll be part of the next to see experiment. Thank you very much.